welcome to anybody that's watching out there in live streaming land. Uh, this is the April presentation of the Historical Society of Frankfurt. <clears throat> and John Buffington will talk about that in just a minute, but I wanted to talk about a few upcoming events. <clears throat> uh, April 30th, uh, the last Saturday of the month, we have the Northeast History Fair coming up, uh, and we'll be selling copies of this new book by John Manton, The, the Borough of Frankfurt. Uh, he'll be there. And also, two months from now, our program will be centered around this book, uh, The Borough of Frankfurt, and you can get signed copies by John Manton. Uh, and next month, one month from now, we have uh, the Cowden drum, the Cowden Civil War drum uh, will be the topic of our discussion, the restoration project that we recently had done. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce John Buffington. Good evening. For the record, that's uh, this is the April 2022 meeting uh, of program meeting of the society. Uh, I'd like to uh, make sure that we get all of that information in so that someday when this uh, all gets indexed, uh, we're going to combine the uh, programs that we're doing now with the rich uh, published uh, paper copies of, of what, what went before. In the, uh, in the early uh, decades of the society, and uh, I want to have those indexes all inter interlinked. Uh, so this is April 2022 program of the society. Uh, tonight, we're joining in the celebration of the centennial of the uh, FERCO string band. FERCO, uh, does not, is not a, a Frankfurt institution per se. They're in the neighboring borough, the neighboring community of, of uh, Bridesburg. Very close, very close, next door neighbors. And uh, we don't have a string band in, in Frankfurt, so we're jealous. Uh, there are actually two, and I won't mention the other one, I'm not sure if that's a, if, a sore subject, but. The other one uh, is down there in, in Bridesburg as well. Uh, and we're, we're delighted to have FERCO here. Uh, it's a particular delight to me because of my personal history. Some folks in our audience uh, tonight uh, may be um, baby boomers like me and remember that uh, we were learning to walk. Uh, from our, our greatest generation parents at the same decade when uh, network television was learning to walk from the, uh, primarily I think from the, from the executives of the uh, radio networks that went before. And uh, so we grew up together, uh, the baby boomers and the uh, networks. And in the early phase of network television, one of the obvious things to do, one of the easy ways they could do something to demonstrate that the uh, that television had an advantage over the previous modes of mass communication was to do live coverage of real events, current events, uh, right on the spot. So football games and beauty pageants and political conventions and inaugurations and parades. So the memorable ones for me that, that I have a recollection of now are the Rose Parade, which was kind of a top-down corporate sponsored thing where corporations built floats and and they had bands in between, and uh, paid attractive young women to sit on top of them. And uh, then uh, there was the uh, 
the one in New York City, uh, a Thanksgiving parade ending with a paid, thanks, paid uh, Santa Claus. Uh, our Santa Claus doesn't get paid. Um, and we have that in common. We have in common with Perco that uh, and for, one of our guests said to me, I said, I said, uh, Captain Kalenza, you've also been president. And he said, yeah, and the salary is exactly the same, which is to say the same as the uh, board members of the society, and include, one of whom also serves as our Santa Claus. Uh, so we're, we're real happy to have before us tonight an institution which rises from the street rather than being directed from some corporate office. Uh, and that reminds us of us. So we, we feel a lot, a lot of, uh, let us say brotherly love with uh, Furco. My life has been organized in large part, my whole, my whole social life has been organized in part by an accident of history because I saw those, those television broadcasts in the early days of television. And three years after I got married, we were, we were uh, my wife and I uh, were unpacking our dishes and, and, and silverware in our first uh, Philadelphia apartment, because that's where our, my career had taken us. And I said, it's September. Now, isn't this the city where they have that parade? And she put down that handful of spoons she was working on. She, she put it down and she looked at me very carefully and she said, why, yes, I used to see that on television when I was a child in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We need to have a party and invite all our friends from Virginia and D.C. To, uh, to come and watch the parade with us and have a party the night before. And that's what we did. And we did that for 13 years at our apartment that was uh, eight blocks from, from Mummer Street. Uh, we, we went to Mummer Street in Pine, uh, 13 years. And our friends would, I'd get up in the morning and I'd wade through and I'd, I'd, I'd put the coffee on and a few of the heads while sleeping on our uh, living room uh, uh, floor would, would, would rise up and we would be the advance team to go watch the, to go stake out our place right on the street at uh, Mummer Street and Pine uh, to uh, reserve for the whole day. And our other guests would, would trickle in in the course of the day. And for, so we did that for 30 years until we moved to Frank, 13 years, sorry, 13 years until we moved to Frankfurt. And then we kept on doing that party though and inviting the friends we tightened our relationship with over that common interest, and that really was the central point of our relationships with our friends for that whole time, 30 years. Uh, it, it, when we moved to Frankfurt, we did, we always had, a, we had the party and we just had the television on in the center of the party. That, that has been such a meaningful uh, experience for me uh, and, and for my friends, and for my friends. I know, I don't know, I know exactly one person who ever denied liking the Mummers, and I think he was just in a bad mood that day. Uh, everybody loves the Mummers. Not everybody is in the same church or the same, has the same politics, but almost everybody loves the Mummers. So it's a delight to be able to say tonight our guests are from the Furco String Band, Captain Anthony Colenza, Solenza, I'm sorry, Solenza, and uh, Michael Caputo, uh, 
uh, Captain Salinda has all, in addition to being captain now, he's been captain quite a long, quite, for quite some years, and he's also been president, which is a different job, uh, and uh, Mr. he's been, he's been a, a, a FERCO person for 48 years, and uh, Mr. Caputo has been a FERCO person for 60 years, and he'll tell you about some very uh, interesting connections that he has with the whole history uh, of the FERCO string band. We're really, really pleased to, uh, to have them here to enlighten us about that. And uh, thank you very much for being here, and uh, you're on. Well, thank you very much. Um, as the, our introduction indicated that uh, my name is Anthony Salenza, I'm the captain of the band. Uh, I'm along with the 48 years and my colleague here, Michael, has been 60 years. Um, and so he has a little bit much uh, more knowledge than I have because he is much, much older than I. Uh, but with that being said, um, when we were asked to come and give a presentation, a little bit of history on our inaugural, um, uh, our centennial year of which uh, we are celebrating. The band was organized back in 1922 uh, by our founder, Joseph A. Furka, a pharmacist from North Philadelphia, who originally was from South Philadelphia and captained another band, uh, but as his career took him to North Philadelphia, he started the Furco String Band in October 1922, and then started the Furco String Band with their first parade under the Furco banner in January 1st, 1923. So in preparation for tonight's uh, presentation, um, we were asked to put a few pictures together and a little bit of, uh, we're going to give you a little slideshow, and Michael will, under the, uh, the best uh, of his knowledge from some of the memory, is to give you an idea of uh, what you're looking at. And we're going to go through this slideshow. Uh, maybe every slide doesn't necessarily need a caption, but we're going to give you a little idea of what the band was way back when. And then we'll have some more uh, interesting tidbits to talk about the band and uh, field any questions uh, at the end. So, Mike, if you wanted to join me, if you may, I'm going to stand off for a little bit. This gentleman's going to run through the slides. Obviously, the first one is our logo uh, commemorating our 100th anniversary. But um, as he goes through the slides, you can possibly make a comment. Uh, and then he'll just move on to the next slide and then uh, we'll keep on going, as they say. Sure. Michael? Well, of course. Uh, well, we come up here. Uh, as you can see, this is Joe Parker with the pharmacist. So this is one of his uh, business cards. Way, way back then, in, I would say, the 1920s. Uh, this would just be a, a normal parade with Joe Furco was right in the center. And this was way back, I would say, probably in the 40s, with the way their uniforms, their dress, and the instrumentation of the band. This would probably be the late 40s, maybe early 50s. This is a typical rehearsal on Tuesday night. The band practices every Tuesday, 52 Tuesdays a year. Uh, our musical director doesn't give us a Tuesday night off. So this is one of the picture of one of the rehearsals. And of course, this is one of our famous songs, uh, any mummer song, I'm looking for a little for the clue. This is a, a suit. I don't remember the exact year, but it was called the Rainbow Suit. So it was probably back in the uh, 30s, early 40s, probably late 30s, I would say. 
The fellow there playing the guitar is Bob Troll. He used to be one of our assistant musical directors years ago. I mean, way years ago. I cannot it's make out New York this. City. New York City. Yeah. Oh, every day for if that's New York City. That was when Bertha performed in the Macy's Day Parade. And if you watch uh, at Christmas time, they have the miracle on 34th Street. Within the first 10 to 14 seconds, you will see the Perko String Band going by and Macy's Parade. Unfortunately, you won't hear the band. They have dubbed in a marching band playing John Philip Susan. But you could see, <coughs> you will see the band from Miracle on 34th Street, the original. There's another one of the most famous string band numbers, Babyface, which the Freco String Band recorded. And it looks like it was recorded back in 1947. This is a Freco Indian suit. Now, I don't remember the exact year, but I remember my father talking about it because he joined Freco in 1928. And he always said they had a gorgeous Indian suit. But of course, I don't remember the year. And here's a full blown picture of the whole thing. And of course, we have Whispering, another nice number from 1947. That's another popular string band number. And big bands, of course, were playing it back at that time. Then. But this is first prize winning in uh, 1950. It's going to be a string band on, on Broad Street. This was a theme that our cowboy theme. And you can see Joe Perko is with the white on there. And next to him was uh, Bob Troll, the phone we sold the guitar a while ago. And to Bob's left is uh, Bill Cassandra. So these are some of his old pictures. Again, this is the cowboy theme again. That's probably Bob Troll directing the band. And that's the rainbow suit we saw a while ago. This is 1953. Berkeley won first prize for the musical gems with that suit. You can see how it was made. You see capes we had back then, and the nice white, beautiful plumes. This is a 1957, my third lady with Joe Glass in the center. I'm not going to mention everybody's name, but that, that was the first prize suit. This, you can see, was a, a trip when we're coming back, but I want to mention the second person with the dark suit on and the dark tie, Curtis Stur Sr. He replaced our captain, Joe Berkman, when he passed away. He was the next captain. This is one of our themes in Egypt and the Nile. And we were on a TV show. Anthony, you can hear a TV show. I've got a secret. I've got a secret. Joe Berkman was on there. I've got a secret. And the, the band was there, and the band performed and played spring band music and everything like that. This is 1963. We did a tribute to New, New York, the Valley Boy. As you can see, with the kind of costumes we wear, which is applicable to that kind of thing. This is our suit from 1964. We were pretty much confused. So, evidently, this was taken as a performance by the band at Plum State Fair. As you can see, there's a cow in the background. So, this was taken. At the state fair. This is a picture with Eddie Tanner. I don't know when it was from, and one of Berkeley's musical directors. That's a long time ago. 
This is a very old picture of Jim. I can't tell you where it's from, but it's it's an old picture by looking at the suits. That what you see there is the sheet music up top with our song, Come Up, which is a number of Parker Polish usually played before our concert. And there's the recording in 1947 of Come Up. This is a repeat picture we had to the prior. Uh, this looks like an, one of our early albums. The Frederick Street Band used to record albums every so often. We would record the next album. Again, this one I would say is if you look at the car. And sometimes in the early 40s. This is the Perkins playing at the Capitol Steps in Richmond, Virginia. And some pictures with the band performing. And then Jack, you can see it was Jackie Gleason. And the Jackie Gleason left the side view of Joe Perkins. That's a most current picture, I would say, from Wildwood, New Jersey. We had a parade down here. And that's our Captain Anthony. The theme, our Mind Well theme. And that's the end of the slideshow. Thank you, Mike. Now then. To give you an idea, again, um, I have a few notes, but I'd rather go a little freestyle at this point. But um, people talk about how we got started and um, how things were a little bit different uh, back in the day. Uh, Joe Furco first uh, started with the Frelinger String Band in 1915. He was a young uh, pharmaceutical student. Uh, under uh, the direction of Dr. John J. Frelinger in South Philadelphia on the corner of Second and Single Streets. And back in the day, uh, the, in order to be in the parade, you needed a banner, uh, sort of like an entry, uh, so that you show you were legitimate, and a sponsor to pay for the banner and probably help pay for some of the costumes. So Joe Perko approached uh, John Frelinger and asked him if he would uh, sponsor the band, hence the name of the Frelinger String Band. Now, ironically, Joe, being the head of a string band, you would have thought that uh, he was an accomplished musician uh, or dancer or saxophonist or banjo piano player. None of the above. Uh, Joe ironically couldn't play a note of music, but he was one of the tallest fellas of the group. And since, uh, based on his stature, they appointed him to be the captain. And in the year of 1915, the Frank Hunter String Band was born with the captain of uh, Joe Perko. Uh, Joe kept the band together under the Frank Hunter name for three or four years, and then he graduated uh, pharma school, uh, pharmaceutical school, and then moved to North Philadelphia to start his own drugstore at Fifth and Glenwood, and a far cry from South Philadelphia at Second and Sickle. And uh, a few years up there, what I can tell you from experience, and Mike will attest to this, that once you become a mummer, it's in your blood, and there, you mentioned the parties each year. Well, we like to perform each year. So there was always that friendship and that, uh, that uh, the group of fellows that wanted to stick together. So they encouraged Joe to start his own band. 
and things were a lot simpler back then, as you probably are aware of. Uh, so in October of 1922, they asked Joe to start his own band, and uh, somewhat reluctantly, but uh, he did, and on January 1st, 1923, the Perko String Band hit the street for the first time under the name of the Joseph A. Perko String Band. So a lot of things happened throughout the years, and um, as, as we saw, there were recordings, um, and Joe had quite a few uh, different rules for the band, very relatively simple, and Mike will go over a few of them in a few minutes, but uh, one of them was to be a gentleman at all times, and there was no exception. And it was a very well-disciplined band, and it thrived through the years, uh, performing all over, and then it continued to perform all over, uh, from New England to Richmond, Virginia, to Kentucky, in later years performed internationally in East France, in Hong Kong for Chinese New Year. So to say that they are truly the world renowned String band is an understatement. Joe had the position of being um, the captain of the band and the leader of his own band. And on a April night in 1964, at a very popular supper club in South Philadelphia, um, there was a plaque given to Joe for his 50 years in Mummery. And Joe stood up and accepted the plaque and made the statement, I hope I'm around for another 50 years to be the captain of the Furco String Band. Joe never made it back to his seat. He collapsed and died instantly of a heart attack right at the dais. So, not expecting any of that, of course, um, the band had to really rethink what are they going to do? How is the band going to continue without Joe Furco? Uh, so one year, one of the years it was uh, just shown, uh, did not have a captain out of respect for the 50 years that Joe put into his band. And in 1965, uh, the second captain of the Furco String Band was elected. He was a previous drill director, Kurt Starr. And he had that position until 1969, when a gentleman, Joe Glass, uh, took over the position, and then Bill Spezial, and a few others, and then myself. So it, it's been a, uh, an honor to march in front of the band and lead the band that Joe Perko started. So I'm going to come back and uh, give you a few more uh, tidbits before uh, we do some Q&A, but Mike has prepared something to tell you about Joe, the Furco String Band Man. Michael? Thank you, Anthony. Yeah, excuse me. Anthony has covered a lot of things, obviously, in his talk about that, so I'm not, not going to make it redundant. I'm going to talk mainly about the history of Joe Furco, the man. All right. A lot of people are going to say, well, how would you know him? Uh, you're not that old, but I am, believe it or not. Uh, my father joined the Joe Perko String Band in 1928. Not only that, but he worked in a pharmacy. He lived a half a block down from the drugstore. Joe Perko was my famous god, uh, godfather, so it was a family thing. Uh, let's talk about Joe now. Who was that man, that dancing captain? Back in that time zone, you had a captain who would lead the band down the street, but they would just march in front. But Joe had his own style. He would dance a little bit, bending his knees and moving around. He started his, his dancing. Why did he inspire such affection in all the men who knew him? How did he perform with such flair? Everybody was amazed when he did things. What drove him to be the best to create and guide the most successful string band? in the history of mummy. And Anthony did talk about that before he went in the snow. 
And Joe was very active in a lot of political stuff, charities, the government, Philadelphia government, and like that. Now, we're in the neighborhood now where we are now. People, I'm sure, have heard of Juniata Park. It's not that far away from here. So in September 11, 1965, the playground at J.A. Community Street in Juniata was named in the honor of Joe Franklin. Now on the plaque they put there, these are the words. The playground sector, Juniata Park today, is being officially renamed the Joseph A. Franklin Playground. It is being named for the organizer of the Fan Franklin Street Band, who was well known as civic leader in the Northeast and was very interested in charitable organizations which I'm going to come to really well. Like Anthony said, Joe had a lot of core values with the band, right? And he instilled it in the fellow play. Do unto others as you have others do unto you. Be nice to people. This is Joe's motto. Don't go arguing and stamping your feet with people. Bear in mind that life is too short. Don't have, don't have grudges. Don't have revenge or anything. Because you don't know what tomorrow brings. And you would say, oh, God, if I've only made up with Joe, with Smith, or whoever it was before that. And the last one, a good reputation is worth more than gold. When you talk about a good reputation, all right, Joe Burko always said, when you are performing, you have something on. This is Joe Burko. The people don't know your name. If you misbehave, the Burko string band gets the bad reputation. You perform well, and people like it, and you get good reputations. The same thing in work. You perform well, you have a good work reputation, good report. And um, Joe, a lot of people don't know. Like I said, I'm talking about his history, just as Joe Perkins. Anthony was talking about the band. Joe was a very, very religious person. When he moved in 1921 to Pittsburgh, London, the, at that time, the closest Catholic, Catholic church was St. Veronica's, was a couple blocks away. Now, every September, Joe Berger will go to Mother Superior and pay St. Veronica's and say, Mother Superior, here's money. Go buy supplies you need for the school year for the students. Now, this is a true story. I can't remember the date when it was, but a couple of good years ago, Berger was doing a job. And I was standing on the right side of the bed. And for Ryan, where Anthony was, were two ladies talking. And one lady said, Oh, well, I know Joe Burke, I used to go to his pharmacy, and I went to St. Veronica's school. And the nuns always told me, if you go in the pharmacy and you see Joe, thank him for buying all the supplies. And Joe was very religious with that. Not only that, he was very religious with the fellows in the band. He was, he was funny in a way. We do a job, and we're on the bus on a Saturday night, and Sunday we have to continue with the job. We get back to the hotel, first thing Joe would say, it's fellow, the bus is leaving at quarter to nine. Nine o'clock, we are going to mass. Everyone is welcome to come to mass, regardless of the denomination that you are. But then he always put the punchline in there, and this was the punchline where everyone broke out there. He said, all right, you guys, I know which one of you are Catholic boys. So I want to see all the Catholic boys on this bus tomorrow morning at quarter to nine. We make nine o'clock mass. That's how religious he was. And St. Joe was not only religious, but he's caring. He cared for pe people in the neighborhood, people outside the neighborhood. It didn't matter. He had a pharmacy. All right? I seen it because I used to go up there a lot. Like I said, I was a little kid. I was going up to the drugstore. It was only half a block away from my grandparents' house. Joe would be in there, and someone would come in and show, say, Joe, uh, I need this prescription for my son. He's, he's really sick. Joe would make the prescription up and give it to the person, and he'd turn and say, uh, Joe, I'm, I'm a, little, a little bit short. I only have this much. He said, just give me the money, and we'll worry about it later. All right? Sometimes people will come in and say, Joe, I need medicine. I, I have no money. Don't worry about it. When you get the money, come see me. And this one here, Joe was like a bat. He actually had people come in, adults, or sometimes children will come in with notes. Mr. Burko, we are short of money this week. Can you kindly spare us a few dollars until my parents get paid? Now, the big thing of it was, how many people paid Joe back 
No one knows that answer. That's how generous he was. You know, he, he just generous. He, he loved people and he wanted to help people. And, and the other thing I was talking about, being religious and helping people. When the band was away, we would go to a hospital sometimes, a children's hospital, and they'd have the children come out on the lawn and the band would play. And Joe would turn around and say, I want five guys to go through the hospital and play for people. The, one of the nurses would take you through the rooms. But these are for the people who could not come out to the lawn. We do form for them, and we have people going through the hospital. The nurses would say, let's go over this room, that room, and that room. Now, I don't want to chew up a lot of the answer these time. Um, unfortunately, as we all know, April 1st, 1895, Joe Berkeley was born. He passed away April 19th. 1964, he was only 69 years old, all right? Now, next week will be April the 19th. It will be 58 years since Joe passed away. Now, Anthony had mentioned about Joe passing away at a bank. I just want to read a couple things about that bank. It was April 19th, 1964. Almost 800 mummers came to Palumbo in South Philly to attend the annual bank and the meeting of the Philadelphia Mummers Spring Band. The grand old man of mummery, Joe Perkle, was receiving an award to celebrate his 50 years in mummery. After a roar of approval from the audience, Joe stepped to the microphone and said, Thank you for this award. Thank you, God. I was here to receive it. I hope that I'll be here for 50 more years. Well, like Anthony says, as he turned and walked, as he began, the audience showed their love and respect for this powerful man. As he turned and walked away, he collapsed. There was a priest there, came in his last rites. Now, that's ironic. Joe died when he was born in South Philly. So we all know he was born in South Philly. And these words, I want to read that these words came from Joe Perko to a band member who was a very, very good friend of his. In 1958, Joe Perko said these words for his friend Harry Leary, who passed away. Harry Leary was the band manager, band manager from the beginning until 1938. Now, Joe wrote, the, wrote these words. And you listen to these words, and you can understand the passion, how he was, how he loved people, and he loved playing and everything. It goes like this. His work is done, but his labor throughout the years have made us not only outstanding at home, but we have made us internationally known. Perhaps our creator, creator, knowing his qualification, needed him up in heaven to take over a string band. Now, unfortunately, this is what we say about our founder, Joe Perkins. So, these are the perfect words for me for the final chapter for the life of Joseph A. Perkins. And I will turn it over to you. Or do you have some more things you want to add? Or do you need help? Thank you, Michael. Um, very uh, intriguing and uh, a lot of knowledge there. First hand knowledge, a little bit more than I had, like I said, only because uh, I'm old. you're old. <laughs> uh, I, I guess in closing, and just in, in anything in life now, uh, there's, it's not what it used to be. And we say that when we walk down the streets, we say that when we watch television or movies, and, uh, or just to see what we see on the news every day. But one of the remarkable things is to keep the tradition alive that a quiet man from South Philadelphia started and with no fame intended, he wasn't looking for the fame, he was just looking to entertain. And his success grew by his simple rules 
You did not disrespect, you did not say any foul. There was no foul language. You were all well groomed, you were respected, and you commanded the respect because you gave the respect. Uh, it's, it becomes increasingly more difficult to do that each year because of what life is uh, and how life has changed over the years and values have changed. Uh, for years, um, the band was an all-male organization. They all, all the bands were that way uh, when they started. And it was only a few years ago that uh, the Berko String Band uh, became co-ed. And for no other reason than a matter of survival. The beautiful costumes you see on New Year's Day are getting more and more expensive. There's only so many fundraisers we can do. There's only so many car washes or bake sales or performances that we can do to fund that. But as you mentioned that uh, we're a neighborhood away in Bridesburg, we have a clubhouse, we have taxes, we have insurance and bills just like everybody in this room. So it just becomes more and more difficult. And at one time in 1982, we won first prize against 27 other string bands. And now this past year, there were 13 bands competing. So where did those members go? They just went by the wayside and maybe it was just too much. It wasn't as simple it was back then, but this is life now. And we're, for us to be hitting this milestone of 100 years, we are very fortunate to have done that. There's a lot of bands that have not had that opportunity and we embrace uh, the conversations that Mike shares with us and a few of the others that were in the band before Mike and after Mike that knew Joe Furco and knew of the times. We had a lot of good times and we continue to have a lot of good times. But when it's time to parade, we parade. When it's time to practice, we practice. When it's time to relax, we have our milk and cookies just like everybody else. So. On behalf of myself, Michael, and the entire Perco band, we want to thank you for having us and for sharing uh, some of uh, your evening with us. Uh, as Mike mentioned, it's Tuesday night. We have rehearsal this evening as we prepare for upcoming uh, performances uh, throughout the year. And uh, we just hope that you will remember we are on the web at perkorstringband.com and there are many videos that could be seen on YouTube and uh, we're looking forward to our 100th anniversary celebration this coming November. Um, if you'd like, if there's any questions, uh, I'm not sure if there's any here or if there's any one that will be coming over on our live streaming portal, uh, we'd be more than happy to address them, but uh, if not, again, on behalf of myself and Michael and the entire membership of the Perko String Band, thank you for having us and uh, looking forward to many more of these now. Okay. Uh if there's anybody with a question here, raise your hand, please. Uh, I have a couple. Yes, uh, Mr. President. Yeah, can we learn a little bit about the instrumentation of the band? Absolutely. The fact that it's a string band uh, started back in the 20s and the teens when the first band started, they want for whatever reason, however this happened, uh, there are no brass instruments. It, there's only woodwinds and string instruments. So the makeup uh, were primarily strings. So it was banjo, guitars, mandolins, banjo mandolins. There were a few saxophones, 
which is a reed instrument, a woodwind, but not a brass instrument. So you'll see no trip, trumpets, uh, you'll see no trombones uh, or tubas like in a marching band. So those instruments basically are the banjo, the string instruments, including a big string bass violin, and accordions, which is a reed instrument, the glockenspiel, and the uh, saxophone. And one of those. Well, that's that, a glockenspiel, a lyre, a, a music lyre, yes. So, does Vanessa have anything remote? No? Okay. Um, uh, my question, I have one question as well. I have a couple. But so one is, um, are you uh, having any success recruiting very young people from the uh, schools in the city of Philadelphia, and is that a problem? It's a problem in general with young people. They're too busy. I have three beautiful grandchildren, and they can really beat me with the little hand gadgets and the computers that they're doing. But I, it, it's a little difficult. Uh, Mike has always been uh, very um, popular with the girls because he played the accordion. I say that in jest. But the point being is one of the instruments is accordion or banjo. And young kids now are not interested in doing that. If you were involved, or, your, or Mike, as he said, it, his father was involved and he played the violin. And ironically, I was not, but a school a friend of mine was involved in a band, and that's how he got me involved as a friend. But young kids right now, it's a little bit difficult uh, to have them be involved. Our music is not of what you would hear of the hip hop and what you would hear on the radio right now. It's more wholesome and it's uh, older time music and um, it, it's a lot simpler. So it's to answer your question, it's it is becoming more and more difficult uh, to one uphold the standards that our uh, founder started with us in today's uh, era. And it's more and more difficult to get young children involved. Uh, plus the expense. Uh, somebody, there's an expense now of uh, uh, another hobby. So if there's an instrument at school compared to being on the football team or the baseball team, uh, sometimes the parents don't have the expense of doing both, both of the hobbies. and they're picking the uh, sports teams, which is still good, but hopefully that gives you a little idea of the struggle that we're all having, uh, not only financially, but uh, for membership. Do you share my sense that the music education has been crowded out, so or, cracked, or pushed into such a tight corner in, in education these days by, by basically STEM, you have so much time that it has to be devoted to all the burgeoning uh, knowledge uh, that, that, that has coming from, from the science, technology, engineering, mathematics, that the, the, uh, the arts have really kind of suffered. They, they get pushed on the back burner a little bit. Definitely, they get pushed on the back burner. Yes, sir, please. Uh, I just want to inject what these two fellows are talking about. Years ago, you, we had sports. We played neighborhood sports. Right? Sandlot. It wasn't as complex as it is today. Today, as soon as the child is six or seven, they're out there learning how to play sport for one reason, that when they graduate high school, they want to get that scholarship to play for the college teams because right now that's that's the, the big thing. Kids want to play sports in college. They want to get that scholarship because it's so expensive to go to college. So as you can see, all the 
reports today how it's becoming more organized than when I was a kid. Well, when I lived at Juniata, we would go to the high end, high end park, get a hardball, a baseball bat, and we would play hardball. Today is so well organized and it's very competitive. I mean, uh, you've got grandchildren or children of your own. You go to sports, whether it's baseball, swimming, football, basketball, and some of these coaches really get upset that this team is not performing as he wishes. So more of everything is heading towards the sports and not so much as into the music. And like Anthony said, the music we play is not the song young people listen to today. It's a different world. The, um, for the benefit of our remote audience, uh, you're not on, the, the Mother's Parade is not on um, uh, network television, but the, I believe the, uh, the local broadcast is available on the internet? Uh, well, right now it is. Um, uh, on, we've just ended a contract, but we're hoping to renegotiate the contract um, with Channel 17. Um, in Philadelphia, but a few years ago, just as across the board, and I know you feel it here, you feel it in, in your everyday lives, but our funding from the city was cut to zero. So there is no longer prize money. You get an attaboy, and you get the title of first prize, but if a Fortune 500 company came in and looked at our books, they would say, well, you're obviously not pretty good accountants because everything we spend goes out the door for, the, and there's no profit. I haven't received a penny, nor has Mike or any other band member since they joined the band, and this cost us nothing. So the amount of money each year to make the productions that you see on New Year's Day and the costumes and the upkeep of our um, our headquarters all comes from performances throughout the year and we have recordings and uh, do things like that to raise money but there's no funding from the city so we get nothing to win first prize and based on the advertising rights and the production costs from the TV stations, we get minimal money. When I say minimal, maybe one or $2,000 from, two, from TV. So we obviously don't do this for the money, but that adds to the fact that we were once up to 27, and now we're down to 13, because the burden is back on us to continue this. Why do we do this? Because, like I said, it's in your blood. Uh, I wouldn't know what else to do on January 1st, but it does become more and more difficult to do this. And the time spent away from your family, the time spent away from your children, because uh, on Memorial Day, you're parading while your family's at a barbecue and you come later, or the barbecue's over and you meet them at home. Uh, but you're, you're obligated uh, to be part of the band because that performance will bring in revenue for the, uh, for the organization and goes back into the pot uh, for next year's costumes. So it is very difficult now, uh, and it's not the way it used to be, but I don't know what it is. I'm sorry I uh, rubbed the <laughs> sore <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> well, I have a counterpoint to that. Uh, this year, um, a lady friend and I uh, got a phone call from a friend, a Bridesburg friend, with a tip uh, that the, the, the time had been announced when Furco was going to get back to Bridesburg on one bus, more, more than one uh, bus? Two buses down on uh, uh, Orthodox. Yeah, yeah. 
and and we got we got wind first time ever first time ever I had anything to do with it. I, I I am not now I never have been a mummy but but uh, you can tell I'm developed. Um, they, we we got wind of this and so we we went down there and we uh, we met the band and we were part of a, of a joyous crowd. So uh, all of us were bridesmaids. Yes, we did. Right. And we, we had right back to the clubhouse. And uh, I, at the, the interesting thing about that experience, I mean, I, I knew the music, you know, I had lots of experience in music, but I never saw you guys up close, up that close before. And at the stops, as, as, uh, as there were pauses, the faces were uncovered because, because they were playing their instruments. So the faces were uncovered. And every face in that band glowed like a new mother was looking at her baby. They were so happy because last year there was no parade, right? And because of the pandemic. So, so they were so happy. You all were so happy to be back on the street. Mummers are joy on the march and joy inspired on the sidewalks. And all I can say is thank you. Thank you. Well, I think that concludes our evening and I appreciate it again on behalf of myself and the band, Michael and everyone here uh, and for those that are live streaming, uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, there'll be some questions a little bit later on. So uh, check out the website and see if there's any other questions. And we'll see you on Broad Street, January 1st, 2023. Thank you very much.